Are you Scottish or British? How much are you prepared for that choice to cost you? And why is this a place to decide? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and ring the notification bell to make sure that you're informed when I upload new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. But which are you? Oh, I know there are some of you that find that an easy question to answer. In fact, you're adamant. There will be transatlantic viewers who think that British and English are pretty much the same thing, and neither of them involve the Scots. In spite of their confusion, they'll still have strong feelings in the matter as well. And of course, there are those that will say, I'm both. There are businesses up and down the country who fly salt tyres and union flags so as to avoid taking sides in a modern day political debate. I mean, you wouldn't want the choice to cost you money, would you? I myself try and walk a thin line on this channel so as not to exclude people. Presumably, that's why I've been called both a rabid nationalist and a lickspittle unionist. You know what side I'm on. Look, I'm not here to change your political opinion. My goal is to persuade you of the importance of this place and to come here and visit. There are people whose job it is to persuade you this way and that. My role is to get you to value your heritage and understand why these places matter. It's a serious question though. If somebody said, you have to choose. Choose wrong and we take away your house, your income and your name. That's the choice that folks were forced to make here at Cambus Kenneth Abbey in November 1314, five months after the Battle of Bannockburn. Medieval loyalties were messy. Allegiances were to feudal overlords. You might have one in England to whom you paid homage for your lands that you held there. Then you paid homage to the Scottish King for the lands that you held here. You probably owed each of them military services part of your rental agreement. It's a bit like somebody in London having a holiday cottage in the Trossachs. But if the landlord gets into a scrap in the pub, you've got to give him honours. But it gets kind of messy when the two countries are fighting each other. As the 13th turned into the 14th century, Edward Longshanks had a solution to the problem. By making Scotland subservient and ruling over the whole of this island, we could be British and Scottish. I don't think the concept of Britishness was quite the feudal mentality, but you know what I mean. In 1314, with Longshanks dead and his son sent Hamer to think again, here at a parliament that November, Robert Bruce said to the nobility of Scotland, no. Choose. The statute of Cambus Kenneth said, It was agreed, finally adjudged and decided hereon with the council and assent of the bishops and the rest of the prelates, earls, barons and other nobles of the Kingdom of Scotland and also the whole community of the Kingdom aforesaid that all who died in war or elsewhere or who in the said day had not come into his peace and faith although oft times called and lawfully awaited, be disinherited forever of their lands within the Kingdom of Scotland, and be held besides as enemies of the King and Kingdom. What are you going to do? You might think that Robert the Bruce was being harsh, but he himself had made that same choice ten years before in this very same place. On the 11th of June, 1304, Edward Longshanks was viciously bombarding Stirling Castle. It was the last holdout against the man who had conquered Wales and thought he'd conquered Scotland. He's the king in charge of the whole of Britain. Or will be once he's dealt with Stirling Castle. And that uh, rebel William Wallace, of course. The traitor who insisted on being Scottish. I say that 
as we stand below the Wallace Monument, perched up on that crag. Wallace, the patriot, made his choice clear. And yet, his monument stands as a memorial to Britishness. If that sounds ridiculous, then watch my video what they don't say about the Wallace Monument. Now, that is the Wallace Monument from the other side. This is a car park in Stirling University campus and on the 15th of September, I'm going to be parking here because over there is the McRobert Art Centre and I'll be here on the 15th of September doing my live stand-up show Stories of Scotland in this very theatre so if you live in the Stirling area click top right and buy a ticket for a show in here tickets for all the shows and information are in the link in the description below now back to Canvas Kenneth Stirling Castle had already surrendered but Edward had a new trebuchet to try out, so he wouldn't accept surrender until he'd had a bit of fun with his new toy. And maybe a wee bit of Greek fire along the way. Robert Bruce was on hand, a loyal subject of this King of All Britain. In fact, that very day he'd formally received Edward's thanks for his services and his debts had been cancelled. After which Bruce said, thanks for that boss. Now, sorry to be a pain, but I'm going to have to rush off for my one o'clock if you don't mind. If I call an Uber now, I might just make it. Round he comes to Canvas Kenneth, and who's his one o'clock appointment? But William Lambert and the Bishop of St Andrews. The fighting bishop. Bruce and Lambert sign a secret pact. In view of future dangers, that they should in all time coming assist each other against all persons whatsoever, that neither should undertake any business without consulting the other, and that each should warn the other of any approaching danger. That's Edward they're talking about, the scheming rats. Even the Abbey gargoyles looked down in horror. That day, Robert Bruce made a choice. He chose to be Scottish. He knew that the consequence would be the loss of substantial English lands, maybe even his life. Several of his brothers, and for that matter, other Scots, and English, Welsh and Irish, would lose theirs in the 10 years that it took to realise his dream of a free Scotland, with him at the top as king, of course. Now he was telling others that it was time for them to make the same choice. I wonder, given his oaths to Edward here ten years before, how much he thought he could trust any of those oaths received. That wasn't just a question for Robert the Bruce. This is the resting place of Robert the Bruce's three times great-grandson, James III. 170 years after it was ordained that Scotland was Scotland and that loyalties had to be decided, that royal descendant of Robert the Bruce died after battle, fighting a civil war against his own nobles who claimed loyalty to James's son. James himself had taken sides in England's civil war of the roses. Now the details are best covered in another video, but the question is, who in both these wars were patriots? And why should they be? And what about those who were never asked? What about the ordinary people who would be conscripted to fight in armies based not on their feelings, but on oaths given by their Lord and Master without any reference to them? The rank and file did much more dying and much less choosing than the nobles who claimed national loyalty. Isn't there an absurdity in the idea that because we're born in a particular piece of real estate, we have to be loyal to a certain king, to give up life and limb for the guy in the shiny hat? That I would share those same loyalties with a guy in Galashiels, Geary, Gauchthrapple and Govan. And yes, there is a place called Gauchthrapple. 
Maybe you're a Canadian and you don't believe in loyalty to the shiny hat person who's bizarrely still your head of state. But you owe allegiance to a clan. Your loyalty is to a thousand disparate people all over the world who have no connection to you other than a name or our American cousins that might think somebody in Glendale, Georgetown, Green Bay and Greensboro should die for a constitution or a flag, a piece of cloth or a piece of paper. Don't you wish there was some place in America called Goat Thrapple? I'm not challenging your ideas of patriotism. I'm challenging you to come to Cambus Kenneth Abbey. If you're one of the thousands who come to Stirling Castle or the Wallace Monument every week but miss this, few historic sites in Scotland sit in such close proximity and hold such history and such contradictions. If you only see Cambus Kenneth Abbey as a unique 65 foot bell tower, a preserved archway to the now lost church and a site of ruins, then you've missed the point. It's the shade of a magnificent building that was key to Scotland's history, where fighting bishops, kings and parliaments sat to decide what is Scotland. It's a burial place of royalty. It's a place to think about loyalty and nationhood, to ask questions. This is a place of decisions. The decisions you take are yours. But do come. My name's Bruce Fumi, and I'm Scottish. Let me know if you are in the comment section below. If you're wondering why the Scottishness or Britishness of the Wallace Monument might not be as clear cut as you imagine, then there's a video coming up on screen now. Support the channel by clicking top right to become a Patreon member, or you can buy me a coffee in the description below. And of course, I'll see you at the McRobert on the 15th of September. Hamendoch is going to be a lamb alive. Cheerio and Rasta.